welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today in the show, we have Charles Hebert. He is an internal medicine physician and psychiatrist, and he wrote the Kevin MD article, Can Patients Just Say No to Treatment? Charles, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin, very much for having me join you today. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Yeah, of course. I started out in South Texas, grew up there for the most part, but then abandoned ship and went to New England to do my medical training at Brown University in, in Providence, Rhode Island. I was there for undergrad as well as for medical school. And somewhere around maybe the third year or so of my medical school training, became very invested in the, the intersection between mental health and behavioral health, as well as just general physical health. So at the time, it was sort of a fledgling idea, but there were about a dozen or so residency programs that did dual training towards dual mm. board certification in internal medicine and psychiatry. And uh, Chicago's program at Rush actually was one of the best that I knew of. And I'm a little bit of an urbanite, so coming to a city was an easy sell. So I, I've ended up in Chicago and had been there actually since I finished my training and have now been on faculty for some time in a dual capacity doing hospital medicine wards as a, as a hospitalist and internal medicine physician, and then directing our psychiatric consultation service. So I, I perform psychiatric consults out to our, our non-psychiatric wards, um, which ends up being a nice way to use both halves of my brain. Sure. So that's my present role. Tell us about some of the, the challenges that you see typically on a daily basis, some of the challenges you see with that intersection between internal medicine and psychiatry. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think is most appealing to me, but also challenging, is that the threats I think that patients face from threats to physical integrity, like say being diagnosed with a terminal illness mm -hmm. or anything that actually has a real chronic core, are, are radically different from some of the things that there are stressors for a lot of people that aren't facing such conditions. I, I tell my residents and trainees that threats to physical integrity are not the same time, same thing as a flat tire or perhaps actually you know losing your job or breaking up in an otherwise stable relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it tends to actually be very jarring for patients, which is actually part of what I enjoy, the crisis intervention piece. Where I practice, I think there's a real healthy respect for the integration of the two and that your physical health has real bearings on your mood mm -hmm. and your mood in turn has real bearings on your physical health. I think the pandemic that we're in has actually really put a magnifying glass over that concept. And now I think that idea has more traction than before. But it's still a challenge to actually get some places to recognize that they're really intertwined, the two mm -hmm. of them. All right, let's talk more about your Kevin MD article titled, Can Patients Just Say No to Treatment? Now, for those of you who get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Of course. When I was originally conceiving of this idea, Kevin, this actually started out as a piece around compassion fatigue, which I had seen so much of in some of my, my partners in hospital medicine. I've had the experience with the pandemic of both directly treating COVID patients as a hospitalist and internist, and then also had the experience of actually tending to their behavioral health needs as a consulting psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote this piece, it was in January, right around the time that Omicron was surging. So our wards were full. And like I said, it started out as a piece on compassion fatigue. But as it took shape, what really actually kind of captured my interest was some of my partners who recognized the misinformation around vaccination for COVID-19. And we were seeing a great deal of that on our wards, and it was leading actually, I think, to a large inpatient unvaccinated population, which was true in most places throughout the country. And I had a colleague who came up to me and said, wouldn't it be possible, shouldn't it be possible that if people are making judgments about vaccination that are based not on the science, but on uninformed or misinformation, uninformed ideas or misinformation, couldn't they just simply be judged to be non-decisional? Mm -hmm. um, and if they're non-decisional and don't have decisional capacity, could a surrogate actually enter into the equation and say, hey, I recommend actually vaccination against COVID-19 in this instance? And there are some, some trickles of that idea in other places throughout the world where a court has gotten involved or a surrogate decision maker has gotten involved because the patient actually was felt to be non-decisional. And it was just a, an interesting idea that I've never actually come across yet. Is it our role in psychiatry as a mental health profession to, to insert our, our influence or insert our judgment around a patient's decisional capacity on this precise issue? And the paper that I wrote or the piece that I wrote argues that that's not psychiatry's place. I, I really don't think actually it's our role to intercede in that way. And our way out of this pandemic to increase vaccination rates, I don't think is for us to go around judging people non-decisional regardless of whether or not their choices are based on misinformation or on the science. 
So what are some of the reasons that you came up with to back that decision? Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones that I've noticed is throughout the pandemic, as people have formulated their ideas around what may work and what may not work for COVID, both in terms of vaccination or acute treatments, the things we're presently using like dexamethasone, even those that we're not using like ivermectin, which some patients have really asked me about and said, is this something that could be utilized? As different people have developed their own ideas and beliefs about what could work, there's been a, a pretty profound distrust of the medical system that's mm -hmm. come forward in some communities. And so I think one of the biggest reasons that I argued psychiatry shouldn't have a place in this argument, it's just not a good use of our skill set, is because it would further elicit or embolden that distrust. I really think the place for us, and this is kind of how I closed the piece that I wrote, is to be curious, to be mm -hmm. empathic, to listen to why it is people might have ideas against vaccination and offer education around those where possible. Or sometimes it's actually happened that we've had people who have come to us and said, look, I got the first dose of the vaccine and had a horrible reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, avoiding judgment at all costs, I think, should be our position, because otherwise I think we further exacerbate that distrust that's already present. Now, tell me a success story. Have there been a case where you've talked to a patient who in initially was resistant to the vaccine and you use some of your techniques that you just talked about to empathize with that patient and eventually convince that patient to change his or her mind about the vaccine? Yeah. So again, I'm an inpatient physician. So we've just recently in the past several months started offering vaccination in the inpatient setting um, based on our stock and supply. We've had some available. And so we've done so trying to reach those populations that otherwise wouldn't might, might not have access and end up in the hospital on account of contracting COVID. So I won't say I have too many success stories, but I do think we've moved the needle a little bit through some of the bedside conversations I've had with mm -hmm. patients. A lot of times I think what has worked has been to um, identify a loved one or a partner or a friend, even just a, a simple acquaintance who actually has a success story of their own and has said that I, I, I got the COVID vaccine and, and nothing happened. That distrust is really paramount. Mm -hmm. And so on the opposite end of the spectrum, identifying someone for the patient that they have a great deal of trust in, somebody that they cherish, somebody that they really love and seeing actually that they had a good outcome has really gone the distance. So I, I think my approach has been just to ask the patient and inquire, what, what are your concerns? What are your worries? Now, were those the same worries and concerns of someone who did get vaccinated where it went smoothly? And that, that seems to be pretty powerful. Now, are there scenarios where patients can be deemed, when patients, if they refuse treatment, can be deemed non-decisional? Yes, there are absolutely scenarios. Um, and that's a big part of my workflow um, as a psychiatrist is to see people in the inpatient setting and patients who, who may not formally know the risks or the benefits or the alternatives of what they're proposing or what's being proposed as a healthcare recommendation, a clinical recommendation. Um, that could be for a colonoscopy, a blood transfusion, a surgery, an experimental investigational drug trial, any of a number of things, Kevin. So th those situations definitely come up as part of my workflow. So when you get consulted for issues like that, Take me through your workflow and thought processes when determining someone is decisional or not. Yeah. So it, it begins with a sort of their cognitive understanding of what it is has been the proposed medical recommendation. So that, that means the risks of going forward or foregoing the procedure or the recommended treatment, the benefits of going forward with it. And then if they can, offering a reasonable alternative. Is there another way that we could get to the same place without this intervention, this, this medication, this surgery, whatever it might be that's on the table? And then the real challenge, but also I think the most gratifying part of my workflow as a psychiatrist is that it should be something that's also commensurate with their, their beliefs, who they are as a person. And this gets back to, like I said, why em empathy and just simply trying to understand the position that the patient is in has so much value in psychiatry um, because two people might choose very, very different paths knowing the risks, the benefits, and alternatives of the same intervention that's proposed, but just because it will affect their life differently, what's called evaluative understanding, making that choice and applying it to who you are as a person. So it begins with those three kind of pillars, but then trying to also assess, does this fit? Is it consistent with who you are as a person and how your life might um, play out going forward? Now, after you wrote this piece where you deemed that someone who did not take the COVID vaccine cannot be deemed non-decisional, what was the general response to it? And that particular physician who asked you that question after he read your, your judgment, what's the general response from the clinician population? 
Yeah, I, I hope they actually saw what I wrote. I don't know for certain with certainty that they did, but I will tell you that I think the general response was it was really well received. I, I think many of my peers, particularly those in psychiatry, thought, yes, this is not a place for us. Our place is to educate, our place is to listen, our place is to be curious, but not to not to offer social judgment. That that shouldn't be our place as a field. So as 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 interesting, and I can understand how some people might get to this as physicians, again, compassion fatigue, couldn't we move the needle a little further if people who were guided by misinformation were felt to be non-decisional? I, I think most of us felt that idea does not have traction and, and erred on the side of empathy. And so I think it, by and large, it was well received. We're talking to Charles Hebert. He is an internal medicine physician and psychiatrist. He wrote the Kevin MD article, can patients just say no to treatment? Charles, you mentioned compassion fatigue a few times during our conversation. Let's give a formal definition of what that is and how that has been manifested in terms of what you've seen in the inpatient wards. Yeah, I think actually the way that we conceive of it is that it may be a sort of a pseudonym or a synonym perhaps for burnout. Mm -hmm. I think burnout personally is much further on the spectrum. I think all of us maybe on a given day might feel some measure of compassion fatigue, which is the idea that you have no more to give and that you may not have any further sympathy or as we were talking about empathy towards a patient situation. Burnout to me is a place that is more chronic, uh, that is more day in, day out. Mm -hmm. But on any given day, based on the clinical circumstances that we face, a person might have some measure of, of compassion fatigue, just feeling that their tank is empty and that they're spent in that given moment. Good examples that I can think of early on in the pandemic, uh, back to 2020 when, when COVID first arrived in the United States, many of us were inundated in the inpatient wards and the ICUs. And I actually, just based on how it is, we came to the pandemic at my institution was disposed towards doing some wellness rounds and staff support, psychological support for those of us in the ICUs. And it, it was very evident that people were just emotionally drained and exhausted. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that point, it wasn't fully related to misinformation and ideas around the COVID vaccine because the vaccine wasn't actually out for use yet. So it can come from different places, but the heavy burden of taking care of patients when there seems to be either no way out or, um, as we're talking about here also, misguided information influencing a person's choices, um, particularly around an illness that is preventable, I think leads to some of that compassion fatigue, that inability to care as much as you otherwise would and that feeling of being spent. Now, from your perspective as a psychiatrist, what are some ways that clinicians can address compassion fatigue? Yeah. One of the biggest ones I think of um, that I, I didn't realize until I was deep into my own training was to bounce ideas off of your partners. Mm -hmm. I think going it alone never really works well, Kevin. And I was surprised in training that people told me, you know, the, the, you'll get great training and supervision and guidance from your faculty, from your attendings, your supervisors. But some of the best training that I got was from people who were my peers at my stage, mm -hmm. who were in the trenches the same way as I, as I was. And so I, I think even for those of us that are now out of training, it certainly held true for our house staff, but even for those of us that are now out in practice, you make your friends in a foxhole. And so it's useful, I think, to bounce ideas off of people. We saw some, some sort of gallows humor that sometimes came forward. People found humor in the situation, even if at times it was sort of morose, mm -hmm. because they needed to laugh. They needed to break through that. And that's a social experience, something that you can't easily do alone. So the best guidance I can give, or at least one piece thereof, is just to, to use your partners, use your colleagues, because odds are, if you're feeling something, they're probably feeling something similar, and keeping it inside and not commiserating about it is just likely to lead to more of that compassion fatigue. And my final question, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Yeah, I, I think far and away, I've been really impressed, Kevin, that sometimes, like I said, when a person, say, refuses COVID vaccination, going back to the article that I wrote, it's been tied to misinformation. Yeah. But I won't say once in a blue moon, but in certain instances, it's happened often enough, even though it's sometimes rare, people have very legitimate reasons for refusing it because they tried, like I said, and then may have be, maybe developed an anaphylactoid reaction or had a, a blood clot developed. And so it, it frightens them to proceed further. I think my take home point would be to avoid social judgment, mm -hmm. even though I think many of us have become resigned and that compassion fatigue still lingers, it's easy to judge. But part of the joy of working in psychiatry is to hear people's stories. And while people may end up in the same place, nobody's process or journey towards that same place, let's say not moving forward with vaccination, nobody's process or journey is the same. And so being curious, I think is probably my take home point. And that by itself, if we just try to understand what a patient's journey has been and soften the blow a little bit and eliminate some of the frustration that we sometimes feel around misinformation. 
Charles, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, of course. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Kevin.